contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Emergency rooms beyond capacity or even closing down. Massive backlogs for test procedures and doctor visits. Tonight, just how precarious is our healthcare system and can it be held together? Then our Ontario Hubs report on record flooding in Fort Francis and beyond. Also, from making streets safer to celebrating pride across Ontario, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, June 24th, and that's coming up on the Agenda. The two plus years of pandemic put enormous strain on our hospitals and the entire system. But according to some medical staff, what is happening in emergency rooms across the country now is worse than during the depth of the repeated COVID waves. Is the system veering towards collapse? Let's find out with, in London, Ontario, Morgan Horfath, past president of the RNAO, Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and an RN who formerly worked in emergency care and currently works in long-term care. And in our studio, Dr. Catherine Smart, the president of the Canadian Medical Association and a pediatrician based in Whitehorse, Yukon. And Dr. Lisa Solomon, an emergency room physician working in the suburban Toronto hospital system. Hi to everybody. Hello. Hi, thanks yeah. for having us. Hello. Um, so I was reading through the research for this, and I think my jaw is still on the floor. So I'm really uh, grateful to all of you because your time is limited for you to be here tonight to talk about it. Um, I wanted to start our conversation by reading something that Andre Picard wrote in the Global Mail. He writes, Collapse doesn't happen suddenly. It's a result of erosion over time until a breaking point arrives. The degradation of Canadian health care services has been ongoing for years to the point where all this sounds blandly familiar. But it feels like we're on the brink now. The COVID-19 pandemic accelerated the slow motion crisis in the way a torrential downpour can lead to the collapse of a cliff that has been slowly crumbling for years. Uh, Lisa, I wanna ask you this question and Morgan, but I wanna start with you. From where you stand in the healthcare system, is Andre Picard accurate? Is our healthcare system on the brink of collapse? I would say, yes, we are on the brink of collapse. It has been, he's right, it's been a slow kind of progression to this point. Uh, when we talk about nurses, we know that Ontario went into the pandemic with 22,000 fewer registered nurses per capita than the rest of the provinces in Canada. Uh, so in Ontario, it's been a significant problem for a long time. And we know that without staff in healthcare systems, so without staff working in the hospital, without nurses, without physicians, without respiratory therapists. Beds are just beds and it's not the bed that takes care of the person who is in it and who requires that um, intensive care or emergency department visit. I think Andre unfortunately is right and that if we don't do something immediately, we will see even worse outcomes than we are seeing now in our healthcare system. And Lisa? Yeah, no, I agree with what Morgan's saying. Uh, for years, we have been saying and, and shouting about the cracks in our healthcare system. You know, from a personal experience even, back in 2016, when I realized just how badly things were for, as a, you know, from the patient side, and even professionally for 16 years of practice, you know, we've known about the cracks of the healthcare system and the pandemic has just widened those cracks and really exposed it to the general population. So I think probably most people didn't know about this unless you really had to engage with the healthcare system, particularly the hospital system over the past many years, people didn't know. People really thought we had a great healthcare system because, you know, if they're going to their family doctor or just for their checkups, you know, it's accessible, it's free, and, you know, people were pretty happy. Uh, but really in the last two years, the crisis that we have been has really exposed what we've known for a really long time and really amplified this issue. And if we don't do something immediately, I think that we're going to be in big trouble. Um, Dr. S uh, Catherine, last week you met with Federal Health Minister um, Jean-Yves Duclos and asked the federal government to intervene. Healthcare is a provincial concern. Why did you appeal to the feds? 
I think the message we're really trying to get across is that this is a problem everyone has to own together. You know, often we think that only the provinces have a responsibility for healthcare delivery, but the federal government actually has a significant role to play as well, and they're also one of the major funders of, of healthcare services. So I think there's an opportunity here for a new level of collaboration between the federal and the provincial governments in terms of how do we stem this crisis off. It's not something that's going to be solved by one level of government on its own, and it's also, I think, challenging challenging when you have 13 essentially different systems all doing things differently and not learning from each other about what's working well, what could be scaled, where are the problems to avoid. So I think it's really time for us all to get on the same page and moving in the same direction. Because um, I think I, I read something on Twitter that said that you're not going to be able to fully understand what it is that we're talking about unless you find yourself in the ER or you find yourself at a, at a family doctor. So Lisa, give us an idea of what's happening in the emergency rooms. Yeah, so right now it's different than ever before is the sheer volume of patients that we're seeing in the emergency department. You know, we always hear about weights, weights for beds and, and things like that. But all of a sudden, we're having way more patients come through the emergency department in June. You know, June's usually a time where there's decreased visits, where things are a little bit quieter. And now suddenly we have this ex exponential increase in visits. And one of the reasons that this is happening, or, or there's multiple reasons why this is happening. Firstly, we have over a million Ontarians who don't have a family doctor. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have a lot of options of places to access care. Secondly, what we're seeing and what I'm seeing really for the first time is so many um, advanced presentations of serious disease and illnesses. So for example, advanced presentations of cancer, um, a lot of severe heart disease, uh, uncontrolled blood pressure, hypertension, emergencies. Why is that? Is it because people had stayed at home during the pandemic or? So I think multifactorial, yes. I think a lot of people didn't want to engage with the healthcare system. They were scared, right? With, with COVID-19, they didn't want to come to hospital. They didn't want to, you know, see any healthcare practitioner. They were worried about COVID-19. Um, if you recall, our government many times had to close down non-emergent care. So things, uh, investigations, preventative care, at times uh, various uh, offices were told to be closed, things were cancelled, and rightly so at the time. I mean, it had to be done. But these all contribute to where we are right now, mm -hmm. um, you know, cancelled surgeries. There's a, a backlog of 22 million services, um, be it diagnostic imaging, uh, investigations, colonoscopies, preventive care, mammograms. Uh, surgeries that we need to catch up on. So we're seeing a lot of that present to the emergency department now because of all those reasons. You hear that number, 22 million. Um, Catherine, you hear that number, you think what? That's yeah. like, for me, it's just shocking. It is shocking. And I think really what we have to remember is behind those numbers are Canadians. These are people waiting to find out things about their health, waiting for surgeries that are, you know, sometimes termed elective, but these are not elective things, right? These are things like getting your knee replaced so that you can go to work and have your chronic pain managed, right? Getting your mammogram to make sure you don't have breast cancer. And I think what, what Lisa's saying is, is this is the end point of those backlogs is people really suffering and prevent, presenting with much more serious illness, which also then in turn needs more strain on the healthcare system because now people need more intervention and treatment to get things back on track. So it, it's sort of like something that's just building mm -hmm. on itself. And Morgan, we've heard um, from the Premier before saying that we're adding more hospital beds. Um, but I read somewhere that before there was a ratio for nurses, like you had one nurse taking care of maybe four people, um, but then it's kind of exploded to maybe one nurse taking care of 30 people. Yeah, so there are no legislated maximums or legislated nurse patient ratio um, in Ontario or that I'm aware of across the country. We do know that nurses who are working in the hospital sector are working short almost every single shift, which means they're taking on a higher patient load than what they normally would. And that prevents them from being able to do all of the assessments and interventions and provide the care that those patients need. So adding beds to the hospital system without increasing our supply of healthcare providers, without increasing the number of nurses that are available to work, without increasing physicians and respiratory therapists and physiotherapists and the entire interdisciplinary team that's needed to provide this acute care to patients in Ontario who, who and across the country, um, it's not helpful to just add beds without thinking about what, what does it take to actually take care of the person in that bed. 
Is this problem, is it just uh, something that's happening in emergency rooms or are, are the parts of the system that have you worried, uh, Lisa? In terms of, it's everywhere in the system. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere throughout the hospital, but we actually, you know, we're sort of the, the backstop to everything. We have to look at long-term care. I think we saw, you know, I've known my entire career about the situation in long-term care, and I actually don't even think I knew the extent of it. Uh, the, the lack of uh, nurses, PSWs and staff in long-term care really was exposed during the pandemic. I mean, as the physician, I never knew that they couldn't put in IVs or give IV antibiotics in, in many of the long-term care settings because they don't have enough nurses. They would have maybe one nurse for an entire floor of residents. Well, one nurse is, is, can't deliver that kind of care to 20 to 30 residents at all. And, and none of us in, or most of us in the hospital saying didn't know that that was the case. And the ratio of uh, uh, residents in long-term care to PSWs um, is it, just astronomical. And, you know, we would hope to give better care to our seniors than what we saw during the pandemic. And it's really because they are understaffed. And that's something that also we really need to deal with. Well, Morgan, I want to come to you next. Uh, you work in long-term care. What does it look like where you work? Yeah, there, I would say there's no sector in healthcare that's been unaffected by this. I work in long-term care. Uh, we regularly work short because we aren't able to find enough nurses to fill all of the vacancies. So uh, whether it's nurses who are choosing to leave the profession because they've had it with the workload or they're retiring, we're not graduating enough new nurses to fill those positions. Um, so to fill the position that are left because of retirement and because of people choosing to leave uh, nursing altogether or nursing in Ontario. And it's become a real problem. It does compromise the safety of residents in long-term care, which is already, um, as was pointed out, a sector that was very minimally staffed because of the funding model in long-term care. So it really has been a challenge there, but we know it's been equally as challenging in the community and without solid community care, without the ability to reliably access community care, it makes it really difficult to discharge people from hospital um, if they can't get the care and service that they need to stay healthy at home. So it, there's no sector of the healthcare system that's been unaffected by this. Um, Catherine, it sounds like all these problems are kind of interconnected. Mm -hmm. um, how much of this current pressure in the system is because of staffing or the fallout because of the pandemic? I think it is a variety of things. Absolutely, the staffing issue is longstanding. We've sort of been heading towards this crisis in terms of the number of healthcare workers for a long time. But this is, again, why it's important to bring the federal government into this discussion, because we have never had a pan-Canadian health workforce strategy. You know, it's quite shocking, really, when you think about it, that one of our biggest sectors, no one has actually looked at the data around who's in the sector. Where are people working? How many people do we need in nursing and medicine and different specialty areas? And of course, all the other healthcare professionals. So what's happened is we've completely outpaced the number of people that are in the system. And now suddenly we're realizing, wow, we've got this crisis on our hands, mm -hmm. combined with a problem with retention. Because not only are we not training enough people, we're starting to lose people from the system because of burnout, because of how people are feeling working in a system that's not functioning. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of got issues on both ends. And what we're really suggesting is there's an opportunity here to create a national strategy around both recruitment and retention planning so that we know the numbers of people that we need to bring into the system. Because, of course, the challenge is you can't create a healthcare professional overnight. It's years of training, mm -hmm. and you need those senior staff to mentor people along as well. So this really needs, I think, a different approach. Um, and I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, but you did mention um, bringing in the federal government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been reading about what's been happening with the burnout is that some healthcare professionals are leaving for better pay in the private sector. Um, should we be having part of that conversation around that, maybe uh, out getting the private, um, privatizing some health care? Well, I think the challenge when you think about things like privatization, and normally when we talk about that, what we're talking about is two-tiered health care. You know, we already have a lot of aspects of public-private partnerships in our current system. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about two-tier healthcare, again, now what you're doing is diluting those same people into two different systems, creating issues with access, issues with equity. And I think we know that Canadians value the concept and, and the ideal of a universal healthcare system. But what we have is a system that has been
been neglected for too long. It's not that it can't work, it's that it's not going to work if we're not solving for some of these problems. And something like a pandemic screams for solutions. It does. Um, I wanted to read something that the RNAO conducted a, a nursing survey from May to June of 2021 during the height of uh, Ontario's third wave of the pandemic. Responses came in from 5,200 Canadian nurses, most of them from Ontario, and they reported this. 75% of nurses reported being burnt out with higher percentage among hospital and frontline workers. 73% reported that their workloads increased moderately or significantly during the pandemic. 60% of nurses said they planned to leave their position within five years. Um, and of those who wanted to leave, 42% said they were planning to leave nursing altogether. Mm -hmm. Only 35% said they had adequate support services to spend time with patients and clients. Uh, Morgan, um, if there is a nursing shortage now and even more are planning to leave the profession, what options will that leave hospitals and long-term care homes like the one that you work at? Yeah, so those stats were really shocking when we saw the data. That's a huge number of nurses that are looking at leaving the profession altogether. And as a profession that already went into the pandemic with fewer, fewer professionals than we should have had, it really, really will make it difficult and in fact, impossible for hospitals and for long-term care homes and other sectors within healthcare to be able to appropriately staff their units or their homes to be able to provide the nursing assessment and intervention and care that uh, that people people need. They can't. You can't just put somebody in a bed and admit them to the hospital and expect them to get better without having somebody there to actually complete the assessments to provide the interventions that they need to get better. It's we are heading towards, if we haven't already arrived, at a really significant staffing crisis um, that needs immediate solutions. And um, as we heard earlier, it's not, it's not an immediate solution to say increase enrollment. It takes four years to become a registered nurse. It's, a, it's an undergraduate degree that's required. That takes four years. It takes two years um, to become a registered practical nurse. So we're looking at a significant amount of time to be able to solve this crisis unless we look at some innovative solutions to help uh, graduate people more quickly or to be able to help um, people like the internationally educated nurses who are living in Ontario who are waiting for registration with the college to be able to practice. Um, those are some of the more immediate solutions to be able to solve and work towards um, a Band-Aid solution while we work on a, an upstream prevention solution for this problem. Lisa, I saw you nodding. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's similarly with physicians as well. It takes 10 to 12 years to train um, a physician. And so we need to look at a long-term strategy, but what do we need to do now? And I think it's similar for both physicians and nurses is the burnout. I, uh, the OMA conducted a survey that showed that 72.9% of physicians um, acknowledge that they have some sort of burnout, which is huge. And what we're seeing also are a lot of physicians leaving the profession or leaving aspects of their profession, particularly family doctors. A lot of family doctors um, were burnt out to begin with before the pandemic and really the pandemic even um, caused this to increase exponentially. But we're already short family doctors. We're already short family doctors and 25% of the family doctors in Ontario are over the age of 60. So if you can imagine, a lot of family doctors now who are over 60 might be retiring earlier than they would have because of a the burnout that they have um, dealt with over the pandemic and or or other reasons and um, or leaving to do other forms of medicine or just other other jobs even and so and a lot of these family doctors have large practices you know these people carried uh, huge numbers of patients and now new doctors coming in practice in a very different model we also have so much downloading of paperwork and administrative work onto physicians and so we can't no longer uh, graduate one family doctor to take care of over 2,000 patients so as a physician who's retiring might have a practice of 2,000 to 2,500 patients. That might take two or three new grads to take over. 
in order to be able to uh, take care of all those patients. But what we need to do also is look at other things. Like we can't keep downloading all this administrative burden on physicians. We need to look at other alternatives, ideas, other staffing models, team-based care. You know, when I practiced family medicine, I was the dietitian, the social worker, the psychologist, the friend and the family doctor. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't do it all, it, it, we just can't. And really what we need to do is have more team-based models of care, where we have an interdisciplinary team of healthcare providers, including a family doctor, a nurse practitioner, a dietitian, pharmacist, a social worker and or psychologist working together as a team in order to provide the best care for the patient and that everybody to do what they're actually trained to do the best way possible. Um, Catherine, Lisa mentioned that uh, June is not usually a busy time in hospitals, but it is right now. Mm. Uh, fall is coming, winter's coming, flu season. We're still in a pandemic. Um, and I read in the news earlier this week that in the city of Montreal, emergency rooms will be facing partial closures. Um, as we, we've discussed on this show before, we've seen this happen in underserved rural parts of Ontario, but not in our largest cities. Will this be a problem here as well? I think it absolutely will be a problem. And I think that's why you're, you're hearing many of us in the system use words like collapsing, is this is our fear. You know, already we're overwhelmed. You're not being alarmist. I don't think so. I really, I really don't. And, and it's for this exact reason, you know, these issues around staffing, retention, access, in the past have been largely restricted to sort of rural areas, places where it was harder to retain people. Now we're seeing it across the country. There's no province that doesn't have this issue. We're seeing it in major cities. We are seeing major hospitals on diversion because of lack of staff. We're hearing about emergency department closures in urban centers, as you've said, and that's right now. We know that fall will be worse. There's no question we're going to see more viruses circulating, more disease. Everyone's anticipating a potential another wave of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And of course, we still have the backlogs that we have to address. So it's really hard to understand with the resources we have right now and the level of burnout with our staff, how is this going to get better as we move into the fall? Mm -hmm. So I think we are really at a very risky time. I think we have some time between now and then to, to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important, you know, there are no easy solutions here. There's our whole system needs a rethink, but we've got to actually show the people in the system and show Canadians that we're serious about doing that work. And I think right now for many healthcare professionals, there's a sense of hopelessness because they're not necessarily feeling that their governments are acknowledging this problem, being transparent about it, and really bringing them to the table to provide those solutions. And I think hope is necessary, right? If you keep being asked to show up and do this every day, you need to feel like you're on a team and that those people have your back. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, Morgan, we found out today that Sylvia Jones is the new Ontario Minister of Health. What is the most immediate problem that the minister has to address? Uh, so in Ontario, the most immediate problem to address is the repeal of Bill 124 and to refrain from extending or imposing any further wage restraint measures on our public sector employees, which includes all of our healthcare workers. That really, um, as we just heard from Catherine, makes people feel like they're not part of a team, that they're not valued and that they're not working with the government to work towards solutions. So that's something that needs to immediately be done. Um, but also looking at other recruitment and retention um, avenues. So looking at helping to bring back nurses to Ontario who have either left nursing or left the, um, the province or the country if we're looking at a Canada-wide solution and really making it um, a, a good profession to work in and making sure that people feel valued and appropriately compensated and respected for the work that they do, which is really important work for the people of our provinces and the people in our country. Lisa, I want to ask you the same question. What is the most immediate problem Mr. Jones has to address? Yeah, I mean, I will give another, you know, shout out to Morgan because I think really that is number one for for all of us, you know, repealing Bill 124, um, supporting the nurses because I think when we're adequately staffed with nurses, um, then it makes our job as physicians 
easier, more enjoyable with being able to work as a team. Um, but from also from the physician side is we really need to address this family physician shortage and what we can do now. You know, obviously we can train more now for the immediate term, but we need to create these uh, interprofessional teams, which can be done now. We, we have models, family health teams. There are some really great models that exist now. And, and really, I would encourage her to open up more now, take the, the best examples of them and model it after them and being able to have every Ontarian to have a team of providers and every family physician to be able to work with uh, within an interdisciplinary team. I can imagine uh, maybe the anxiousness uh, a lot of you in the profession are feeling. I'm feeling it just having spoken to you all, um, but it feels as if a lot of this stuff is going to take time. Uh, mm -hmm. Catherine, our first ministers meet annually with their federal counterparts and discuss issues in our healthcare system. Hallway, hallway uh, healthcare existed before the pandemic, as did shortages of long-term care beds and a lack of resources in community care. How come they haven't been able to fix all those issues in all these years, um, forgetting that we're also going to have to deal with what's going on mm -hmm. and what potentially could be happening in the fall and winter? I think the challenge with something like the healthcare system is it's not a politically expedient issue to really dig into, right? Because as you've heard from all of us, there's some very deep, long-standing issues that really are about modernizing the system. And these things are going to happen over a timeline that is probably not necessarily a political timeline. So I think this is really a time that we need to make this a nonpartisan issue. We need to make this not about slinging mud at each other in the press. We need to make it about pulling together for Canadians. The healthcare system is essential. People don't want it to be a political hot potato where no one's taking responsibility. Canadians want their healthcare system to work. The people that are in the system are deeply committed to the work that they do. They're well trained. We have excellent providers in this country. We can no longer sort of burn them out in this system that's on fire. So I, I hope that what our governments come to understand is we understand that it's not going to be easy for you to fix this maybe in your term, but if we get on the right direction, we're all moving in the same direction, it is something that we can do over the next years and decades. And to remember that it's people at the center of this, right? That's right. Um, thank you so much. I know your schedules are very busy, and it's been such a privilege to speak to all of you tonight. Thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate it. Thanks thank for you. having us. Thanks. Thanks. Twenty-four communities in northwestern Ontario declared states of emergency due to spring flooding. Fort Francis is one of those. Charnell Anderson covers the northwest for our Ontario hubs, and she joins us now from Thunder Bay for more. Hi, Charnell. Hi, Nam. Uh, it's really great to see you. So for Fort Francis is on the shores of Rainy River in the northwest. Uh, is there anything geographically that makes it vulnerable to extreme weather? Yeah, so Fort Francis, uh, which is about a four hour drive west from Thunder Bay, as you said, sits right on Rainy River, which sort of acts as a dividing line between Canada and the US and to the east of Fort Francis as well uh, as Kutiching First Nation. Um, they're bordered by Rainy Lake. And then there's also a small tributary that runs through Fort Francis, which feeds into Rainy Lake. So the community is surrounded on two sides by these bodies of water. Um, which all come together to form part of the Rainy Lake of the Woods watershed, which flows uh, northwest towards Lake Winnipeg, Manitoba. And, you know, despite the fact the community is surrounded by water, there are a number of dams uh, within the water system that, within reason, can help to control the water levels. Uh, so these water systems are monitored by different boards who keep an eye on the water levels and can use the dams to adjust the flow of water. And so they can anticipate things like... Um, the spring snow melt, for example, and make room in the lake for that extra water. But uh, these water systems, you know, the, the rivers and the lakes, they have their natural features, their natural channels that can slow down the flow of water and even cause uh, it to back up in certain spots, um, which ultimately affects how much water can be released without contributing to a flood. So the system works pretty well in terms of controlling water levels during normal weather, but when you get the kind of weather, the kind of weather that we've been seeing since last fall, um, it creates challenges and can overwhelm the systems that are in place. Well, this spring, um, how did lake levels break records this past spring? 
So it's not something that happened overnight. Um, it was a pretty, uh, after some pretty intense drought conditions last year, uh, we got a fair amount of precipitation starting into the fall. And then in the winter, we got a lot of snow. Um, I spoke to David Phillips, who is a senior climatologist at Environment Canada, who explained that Kenora Rainy River, living up to its name, um, uh, got almost twice as much pre precipitation as normal from October through to May. Uh, David said we ended up with about 150 or more centimeters of snow than we'd normally get, which is just shy of five feet. You know, that's a whole person's worth of more snow than the area would normally receive. And to make matters worse, it was cold. It was really cold. So the ground is frozen. That meant going into the spring, the ground couldn't absorb the snow melts or the additional precipitation that we received. And we got some pretty heavy spring rains, as well as a number of Colorado lows, which bring with them a heavy precipitation. And um, as David said, and I quote, these Colorado lows were lined up like jumbo jets on the airport tarmac coming one after another, end quote. Um, so, you know, which again resulted in twice as much precipitation in the form of rain this spring. So it's really this cumulative effect with all this water that had to go somewhere. And in this case, you know, it ended up in people's basements on the road. And of course it also went into the waterways, which swelled enormously. Um, Rainy Lake rose about 1.4 meters over its usual high water levels or about four and a half feet. Again, pretty well a whole person <laughs> and you know, that water ended up on land. So. You know, we really should not underestimate the power of water. It changes lives, right? The impact to the people there must be so great. Uh, we have a, a picture to show. Um, let's take a look at a before and after picture of Point Park. What can you tell us about what it is that we're seeing on the screens here? Right. So Point Park, um, it sits on a peninsula on Rainy Lake on the east side of town, Fort Francis. And it's a recreation area where people normally can camp and fish and sunbathe and, you know, enjoy the summer. Uh, but as you see in these photos, which were taken by Raymond Calder uh, using a drone, the first photo on the left is from August 11th, 2019, and everything is normal. You can see the train tracks. Uh, there's a baseball diamond. That's what it usually looks like. And then on the right-hand side, uh, this photo was taken on June 4th, just earlier this month. And there's some pretty extreme flooding. Point Park looks to be about half underwater. Um, the baseball diamond's underwater. There's water washing out much of the roads. Thankfully, the train tracks were elevated enough that they were not underwater. But I understand that there were some concerns about stability. So there were people there monitoring and trying to build up the tracks a bit. Um, but ultimately, I think they were spared the worst of the flooding, the train tracks. Wow. It, I mean, when you look at the pictures, it's very beautiful. It's, it's breathtaking to see how much water was there. Um, what other damage? was done due to heavy rain and flooding? So there was a big storm in late April, uh, April 22nd or so, which led to a lot of wet basements and washed out roads. And it also led to the failure of one of Fort Francis's wastewater lift stations, which led to huge backups and ultimately led the town to declare a state of emergency. Um, you know, as you said off the top, Fort Francis is one of 24 communities in the region to have declared a state of emergency because of flooding since March 30th. So, you know, um, these issues are not limited to Fort Francis. This flooding has happened all over the region, as well as in Minnesota to the south and Manitoba to the west. But over in Fort Francis, um, Travis Robb, who is the town's operation facilities manager, he says, you know, because of the proliferation of smartphones, this is one of the most well-documented floods in the town's history. So they have a good sense now of where the town's weak spots are. But we don't have a full picture of the amount of damage that's been done because even though it appears the water levels have stabilized, it'll be a while yet for the water to recede completely. And that's really weather dependent. So as the water begins to recede, the town will be assessing the damage and then doing the necessary repair. Well, you mentioned uh, Travis Robb, uh, who's Fort Francis Operations and Facilities Manager, and he said, 1950, 2002, 2014, 2022, there's clearly a pattern here where things are getting closer and closer together. How is the region preparing for escalating weather events? Yeah, so, um, you know, what's really interesting about this flood is that it's coming right after a drought in the region last year, which contributed to a lot of forest fires that burned a lot of forest. And, um, you know, Fort Francis wasn't directly impacted by the drought necessarily. It was more of a regional issue. But from everything being bone dry last year to now this year, it's soaking wet. You know, it begs the question about how we prepare for these extreme weather events, which, as Rob says, appear to be getting more frequent. Um, you know, the last major flood in Fort Francis was in 2014, only eight years ago. And before that, it was 2002, 12 years ago. Um, 
So, and, you know, they've done some remediation work after the 2014 flood. Uh, you know, they built up the waterfront and it helps, but it obviously couldn't prevent this kind of flood uh, that we're seeing now. So, you know, as Rob said, they're going to look at the weak spots and see what can be done to build them up to prevent future damage. But, you know, how do you prepare for the unpredictable? Exactly. Um, you can only do what you can do, learn from the past, I guess. Chernel, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, Chernel, you actually wrote a piece for us on the website, so if people want to know more about what's happening in Fort Francis, they can access it there. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nan. The agenda this week considered how conservation could help further reconciliation between Canada and Indigenous peoples, learned how pride is celebrated in Canada, and sat down with Canada's first openly gay judge to reflect on his career. The agenda's week in review begins with how to make roads in the province safer for pedestrians and for all road users. Jeff, I want to start with you and ask you this. I know that there are people watching this or listening on podcast who are saying to themselves right now, you know what? Accidents happen, and the best engineering in the world is not going to stop it. Uh, you can make all the Highway Traffic Act amendments you want. You can reduce speed limits all you want. As awful as these tragedies are, we just have to accept that they're going to continue to happen. I want to know, in your view, whether that is the accurate and right thinking. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for the question. And uh, first, just let me offer condolences to the Brock family and, of course, to Eleanor, whom um, we've had these conversations with. I, I mean, sincerely, it is a tragedy, and um, I just want to extend my sympathies for their losses. Um, this notion, Steve, that these are accidents, that these are not preventable, um, that's not correct at all. Um, certainly, there is always going to be human error. There's going to be um, some incidents where, where we are going to have unfortunate outcomes. But through design and through awareness and through education and through attention of our community, we should be moving in a direction where our rate is reducing every single year. And that hasn't been the case. And that's problematic. And I think that shows, um, I think some of the things you were trying to get at with your questions to Eleanor is about a lack of political will, uh, a lack of energy, a lack of resources being dedicated to what is really a, a, an enormous urban and rural problem for Canada and the world. All right, Shoshana, let me follow up with you on this. In the larger cities of this province, you got cars, you got trucks, you got motorcycles, you got bicycles, pedestrians, skateboarders, rollerbladers, e-scooters, and no doubt other things as well that I haven't thought of yet. And they're all trying to share the road safely for the most part, sometimes not so safely. I'm sure we've all seen examples of them all doing things, uh, people walking carelessly with their faces in their devices or cars running red lights. Anyway, we know the list. My question is, is it beyond our ingenuity to make all those disparate modes of transportation work together harmoniously on the same roads? Absolutely not. We know how to do this. We are by no means the first place that has tried to wrestle with these problems. Cities all around the world have worked on how do we share and how do we take road safety. And we know the answers. And Steve, I think it's important to reflect on something you said in your introduction. You know, is it bike lanes? Is it making space for non-car modes? It's dangerous. And it's absolutely false. There's been research done by everybody, including by myself, that shows that making bike lanes makes things safer, making wider sidewalks makes things safer. The car and the people driving the cars are the ones most likely to mess up in a way that kills somebody. And that's a choice we make through our infrastructure. When we prioritize cars, we are saying we choose death um, because we want a couple minutes of convenience. We don't have to do that. There's lots of examples on how to do it other ways. And the choice to do it at the moment is willful ignorance. Well, okay, I don't want to leave everybody with the impression that nothing's been happening on this because, Eleanor, as I mentioned a moment ago, you did found this Share the Road mm -hmm. Cycling Coalition. Mm -hmm. Can you tell mm -hmm. us Tell us a couple, two or three things that the coalition through its work has been able to do over the years that you think actually has made things safer. Uh, I'll start with an $125 million investment in cycling infrastructure. Shoshana is absolutely right. Uh, there's a false paradigm around the fact that cycling infrastructure makes streets less safe, Steve. In fact, 87% of Ontarians 
according to Share the Road data, are cyclists and motorists at the same time. This is about finding ways to share the road. And as she also points out, other countries, other jurisdictions in Europe in particular, and in the United States, and in Canada too. I mean, I mentioned Montreal a few minutes ago. They are prioritizing cycling and walking. I spoke to several mayors. I spent 10 days in Quebec in small towns. And their first statement to me was, we are prioritizing uh, active transport because it's a way of the future. We need to achieve, achieve our climate goals. But in order for us to attract the next generation of worker um, and, the, and families and the kind of um, communities we want, we are going to prioritize these modes of travel because 40% fewer young people are driving these days, Steve. Hmm. Fewer and few, fewer young people are getting their driver's license. Uh, because it's it's not affordable. Uh, they are choosing to get around differently. And cities around the world will tell you that they are attracting jobs and investment as a consequence of making those decisions. Um, Pittsburgh, a, a city that Jeff knows well, uh, he's from Philadelphia, uh, has done that very thing in attracting Google to that city. Uh, the mayor of uh, Pittsburgh tells the story about sitting down with the CEO and uh, promising a number of things in order to secure that investment. And the CEO said to him, this is what I need. I need a bicycle friendly city. I need um, transit related development and I need transit options because my people are not driving as much anymore. Obviously, there will be some who think that land conservation is inconsistent with resource development and therefore there's a collision course as opposed to a collaboration there. Mm. Not the case? Not the case. Um, there are certainly um, sections that are going to be appropriate for resource development um, and there are areas that are going to be really important for conservation and I, I'll share a personal story with um, how we can actually achieve those. Please. Yeah, well, you know, being, you know, my daughter loves, she loves to hunt and fish, and these aren't my typical hunting clothes, but, you know, if I had a little camel on here, it is green, I might be able to sneak up on a moose. But I am a very much a big user of the land. I hunt and fish, but my daughter comes to the land with me. We go to the water, the creek. We live on Lake, uh, Lake Nipigan, which is the biggest lake in Ontario, surrounded by the Ontario borders. I, I was just there yesterday fishing, drinking the water right out of the lake, and it's totally protected. Then I can go down the reserve road, go to our sawmill that our community owns and we're developing uh, lumber for our community and for the region to use, um, for instance, in mining. Then we go across the Trans-Canada uh, Highway, then we go across the Trans-Canada Pipeline, which provides natural gas, uh, as well as you know my, one of my grandfathers helped build that. Then we go to areas which are being explored for lithium mining. We hope to have uh, lithium mines in the next couple, two to three years, which is going to be a, a really important mineral and battery production and green transition. And then we go down the road a little bit further, and there's a hydro development, which my uncle uh, runs for on the behalf of three First Nations and our partner with Axor. Mm -hmm. So we've got it all, and and it's not it's not an accident. Um, that uh, we've got good economy and conservation. I can practice my land traditions with my daughter and pass those on. We, we can actually have it all. Bob, are you buying that cohabitation agreement we just uh, heard more about? Um, yeah, I think I think um, really hit the nail on the head, you know, finding that sweet spot of uh, sustainability and, you know, protected areas and being able to uh, exercise Section 35 rights. It's definitely... Um, what people are looking for, I think, you know, one of the um, one of the messages we've always heard from indigenous communities is, look, we're, we're not get we're not against development, but it can't be development at all costs. We've got to try and find a way to uh, incorporate, you know, um, our our land values and um, you know water resources. And where I come from, I, I'm a little bit different here, out on the uh, west coast in Victoria where I'm uh, talking to you from today, we're uh, fish people. So we worry a lot about fish and um, making sure that that's uh, an available resource for people that, and, and it is impacted by uh, forestry and climate change and a whole bunch of uh, other things that can really uh, impact. But I do think it is something that we have to strive to do. Um, you know, uh, when we think about total conservation, one of the one of the challenges is it, it'll make it hard for the nations to move away from the Indian Act if they're not self-sufficient. So I think what uh, JP was talking about just makes so much sense. Faisal, anything inconsistent about what JP has just described and what you're about? No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disagree at all. I think the key thing here is it has to be indigenous-led, and you know there are examples of where indigenous protected and conserved areas are being established by indigenous nations in response to the threat of 
industrial development. For example, Grassy Narrows First Nation, which I know the, your program has looked at, they have decla declared essentially their entire traditional territory as an indigenous protected and sovereignty area, largely in response to the threat of mining and logging within the traditional territory that has the potential to exacerbate a very tragic situation, which is mercury poisoning of the watershed. In that case, what the, the nation has said really clearly is they're not opposed to industrial development within the territory, but they want to bring some certainty around how that development is going to proceed. And they see indigenous protected and conserved areas as one manner of exerting their governance and their sovereignty in response to the sorts of activities that they do not want to happen. The same thing's happening in other First Nations as well. The Tolopiat First Nation, for example, established an Indigenous protected and conserved area uh, in on the west coast of uh, uh, British Columbia, uh, close to Tofino, in response to the threat of clear-cut logging. Uh, the Chilcotin people have done the same. They established uh, Dasico. Uh, indigenous protected and conserved areas. So I think the key thing here is it has to be indigenous led. And when we say indigenous led, it's not just about respecting and upholding the rights of indigenous peoples to be decision makers over their own traditional territories. It's also about integrating the knowledge systems that JP talked about, the very sophisticated understanding that indigenous peoples have over their territories, which in many cases actually goes well beyond the understanding that I, as a Western trained scientist, have of how nature is actually operating uh, within vast areas of, of the country. Amy, could I get you to follow up on that in this regard? Do you think there's anything controversial about the indigenous led nature of this exercise here? In other words, it, 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 is the rest of Canada, do they understand that's what's required here? Yeah, you know, I think that many Canadians still have that kind of older idea of conservation where it's, you know, keeping wilderness and removing people from areas. So, um, you know, when the establishment of parks and other things where people were kind of cleared out to protect wilderness. But I think what we're talking about here with Indigenous-led conservation is the recognizing that Indigenous peoples and peoples in general are an important part of the landscape. Those are our relations, our relatives, and that we can't really be excluded from them. So it's trying to see how we can sustainably all live together. And I think the point that JP made about, you know, development, I think that Indigenous people are highly adaptable and have never aren't against development, but it just needs to be done in the right way, in the right places. Um, so, for example, not a ceremonial site or archaeologic site or something like that. For us, this was actually a very easy decision, you know, honoring the fact that Pride started in response to police brutality and in response to the over-policing of marginalized bodies. We don't want police necessarily in uniform at Pride. We recognize that there's a lot of deep-seated trauma within our community that, you know, is going to make it feel unsafe, even if the police in our community aren't doing things at the moment that are unsafe for queer folks, there's still that trauma there. And we want to make sure that we are honoring our community first and foremost. And so what we've said is that, you know, if they want to come as individuals and support and be allies on an individual level, they are more than welcome to come. They can't wear their uniform. But you know what? show up as an individual but as an institution as policing we don't want that in our communities because we know that it's going to make people feel unsafe and not want to attend and that's the last thing we want to do is isolate already you know isolated communities and members of our community all right but maybe i can pick up on something on this yeah. quickly because what i worry is that the discussion about whether or not police are marching in a parade it actually to me feels like a bit of a distraction yeah. What two mm -hmm. LGBTQ2 plus communities across the province, across the country are calling for are, are real changes in the way that police mm -hmm. interact with these. And, and it's not just two LGBTQ2 plus communities, yeah. it's the intersections of uh, Indigenous communities, racialized communities. Yes. Uh, and, and and this actually, for me, serves as a distraction. We spend more time talking about mm -hmm. what someone's going in the parade than talking about, are we going to spend and redirect the increasing budgets year after year from the police to frontline community services who are providing really important mental health support, homeless uh, support for, for folks that are without housing, folks that are, are facing issues with accessing food security. Uh, instead, we spend a disproportionate amount of time talking about is some, what, what someone's going to wear to the parade. And, and, and I would just, you know, take the opportunity to say what we need to talk about is, is system-wide reform uh, and, and addressing the bigger picture, not, not how one group 
is going to participate in a parade of, you know, in, in, in Ottawa, over 200 groups are participating. But we spend such a, a large amount of time talking about how this one group is participating when community has been clear for, you know, for us since 2017. Uh, and we haven't seen the change that people are calling for here uh, in that time. Okay. Good point there. I want to change gears a little bit. Sherwin, you talked a, a little bit about the money. Uh, everyone is feeling it uh, across this country. Uh, our pockets feel a lot lighter. And I'm curious as organizers, how have you guys grappled with inflation? Uh, have you experienced the financial strain when organizing Pride events this year? Yes, no, again, um, thank you. This, this year we have seen um, a huge, huge increase in the cost of goods and services that Pride has never seen before. Um, we're talking at least, in some cases, up to 40% increase in um, acquiring goods and services. Um, we're very grateful that our corporate sponsors um, continue to be very present and continue to support. Because I can tell you, you know, the work of Pride and the activities of Pride for us and for most of the Prides in Canada, it is free. So there is no money to be made by these things, the activities that we put on. So having the corporate sponsorship, having government back and support the work that we do is very important. Um, but coming out of COVID, we have definitely seen a huge increase in the cost of goods and services. All right, let's go to southwestern Ontario and London. Uh, how has that financial strain been felt? It's, it's been a hard time putting... We didn't start planning for our festival until February um, because we weren't sure we were going to be in person. So um, we had to kind of try to do everything in a couple of months. Um, and it's been... The cost has been really, really high. Um, security, everything. Just so you know, I just want to go touch back on the parade for a minute with the police because in order for us to have that pride parade in London, we have to have we have to hire 26 police officers in uniform at the, the closed streets to be able to have the parade. So that's a huge cost that wasn't donated to us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, security, everything is, uh, even the tent rentals, everything has gone up like twice the price it was before. Is there anything that you've had to eliminate in pre years previous that would have normally been there because the costs have been too high? No, I've tried not to eliminate everything. I'm trying to count my pennies and everything, you know, <laughs> so, so to speak, to make sure that um, the community has, because it's been two years, to make sure the community has what they had before. You will often hear people say that we have the best family court system in Canada of any place in the world. That's true, but I don't know anyone who, if they had the chance to reinvent, to recreate the family court system now, no one would create the system we have now. It's adversarial, it's overloaded. What we need for people who are going through a family breakup and can't arrive at resolutions of their custody and access issues or their financial issues is counseling. Because people have to get past their feelings of anger and betrayal and pain of the breakup so that they can communicate with each other in a way that is uh, that reinvents themselves from ex-partners to co-parents. You had a great line, Harvey, uh, which you, I presume, used on numerous occasions in your courtroom, which was to divorcing parents, you need to love your children more than you hate each other. That's great advice. D did many parents take you up on that advice? I wish I could say yes. The fact is that the vast majority of people who go through a marriage breakup, and let's not kid ourselves, it's huge, and that, the, the divorce rate is 50%, but that's just people that get married. If you add common law couples to that, we're looking at 80% of couples break up. Hmm. Only 5% of those people ever end up in a courtroom. So 95% of people who break up manage somehow to negotiate, maybe with the help of a lawyer, maybe with a family member, a clergyman, and they resolve. But the 5% you saw. But the 5% we saw are people who become very, very obsessed and very fixated on their particular issues, whether it's infidelity or money trouble or in-laws or bad cooking. I've seen it all. And they So don't... somebody want a divorce over bad cooking? I've seen people divorce over <laughs> uh, air miles being taken from <laughs> one to the other. 
Um, I want to talk about a few of your cases here, and and I'm going to use some uh, blunt language here because this was the language that you heard in your courtroom. Uh, on one occasion, you had a bully in your courtroom who broke another kid's nose, and when you asked him why he did that, the response back was, because he's a faggot. And you being the sexual orientation that you are, I wonder how you responded to that. I was a judge about three months at the time. I remember that case like it was yesterday because the victim, the little boy and his parents were sitting in the front row of the courtroom. And uh, I asked this, this uh, young offender, why did you beat this kid up and break his nose? And he said, because he's a faggot. And I said, well, you look at this. This is what faggots grow up to be now. And uh, there was a gasp in the courtroom, really an audible gasp in the courtroom. And uh, then I sent the kid to, into custody. And the little boy in the front row, whose mouth was, was, his jaws were wide open, I said to him, I did that for you and for me and for every other kid that's ever been bullied. So I hope I made a difference in that little boy's life that uh, uh, you, you can reach all your aspirations, whether you're gay or straight or plaid. <laughs> Do you ever get to find out what happened to the people that you sentenced? That kid, for example, who broke the other kid's jaw. Do we ever know what happened to him? No, but if you're a, a judge in a small town, you probably see the same people over and over again. Mm -hmm. But no, it's, it's very disappointing. And same in family court. You, you have these couples coming in front of you, sometimes for years, and then the case ends, usually because the kids grew up. That's really the only way the case settles, mm -hmm. often. And you never find out. Harvey, the response that you came back to that defendant with is nothing that probably any other judge in the province of Ontario would have uttered. And yet you said it. What, may, like, what gave you the... Um, what gave you the idea to come out that bluntly and say that? Well, it was a moment of truth for me. This was a, an opportunity for me to educate that young man. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, June 24th, 2022. Inflation hit a four decade high this week. Monday, what's going on and can anyone do anything about it? I'm Nam Kiwanika. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a terrific weekend and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Laurie Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. Fans change queer representation on television. Fans begin to construct parts of their identity around the shows that they love. I connected with her like I've never connected with a character before. Queer fandom, I think, was very dedicated to the idea of reading into the text. From subtext, by the last episode, you like, just kiss! Like, what? Am I crazy? To text. It's happening! I've never seen a show about like a bunch of lesbians who are cool. Playing an LGBT character, you see the fans, how they react. <gasps> From unacceptable storylines. Lex's death was kind of like a thunderstorm. That's when the internet blew up. It led to people really understanding and what the, the problem with all these dead lesbians was. To more honest representations. Maybe Wonder Woman can be queer. This is the kind of representation that we really hunger for. The more that we have authentic folks telling these stories, the more we're going to understand each other. Queering the script, tomorrow at 9 on TVO. Art, dance, music, they're such good medicines.
We didn't know what we were a part of, but we knew that it was important. This is the story of the Bangara Dance Theatre, a cultural powerhouse, and the three Aboriginal brothers who created it. The three brothers who go out into the world to tell stories of Aboriginal Australia. Using our art form as our weapons. Why wouldn't you just embrace that? It's a story of artistic triumph. The thing we loved the most was creating. Personal heartbreak. My two brothers, little bastards, they left me, and, and I'm really mad about that. And cultural healing. So of course we're going to tell the same stories until we get accepted as a race. Firestarter, the story of Bangara, Monday at 9 on TVO. 19 years after he saved the wizarding world, the boy who lived is back. Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Lumos! This all-new adventure comes to life in this, the eighth Harry Potter tale, live on Star.